It's um, uh, welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here in, in Moscow for the first time. Um, my grandmother, when, before she died, she used to tell us um, that her great grandmother was uh, uh, Russian and uh, lived and worked in the fashion industry in the East End of London. We never found out the proof, but uh, it's very possible that my great grandmother was Russian. So, anyway, um, so finally I managed to come to Moscow. Um, Katia probably mentioned that I've been researching my book, Master Planning Futures, that's the title of it, and it will be published next spring um, by Routledge in London. And what I'm doing is um, exploring the ideas and the ideals, so the value systems and processes of contemporary master planning. Um, I'm looking at very many aspects but I'm looking at the ways in which, in different cities, in different continents in the world, um, people working together, clients from public sector, clients from private sector, or maybe a mix of both, uh, working with architects and urban designers, um, achieve radical change through alternative strategies that match society today rather than the way it was to yesterday. So. Um, so what is a master plan? M my firm belief is a master plan, at best, is a set of principles that, that um, through a long process of exploration, stand up um, the test of time. And they're principles for urban change. And they have to be based on a very intense speculation based on research about what that change should be. And they have to consider very carefully um, in whose interest that master plan is going to be for. Is it purely for the clients to make money? Is it for some um, artificial notion of the people who will benefit? Is it to, to, to only uh, encourage uh, the most wealthy? Or is it for the benefit of absolutely everybody in society, including people migrating from the countryside to the cities? So, um, uh, I would say everyone has to have a plan and everyone likes to have a plan at the moment. You hear the master plan word used in, um, in business a lot. And you, in fact, the word came from um, the military, uh, the whole military environment. In the military, they often spoke of having plan A. And if plan A didn't work, they would have plan B. And then there'd be plan C, plan D. And in a way, you know, you can have a master plan for anything at all. But um, I think master planning has somehow uh, gone out of fashion and has now come back into fashion, but we don't want it just to be fashionable, we want it to be really worthwhile. Um, and right now, we have, you know, in the economic crisis and hitting the world, I call it casino capitalism. I like to regard it, the world, the the mess that we're in is a bit like casino capitalism. So I think it's more important now than ever before because you can't just rely on globalization. There's this phrase that economists like to use. They say the, the um, tide, so the, the, the water coming in from the sea, the tide, lifts all the boats for globalization. So basically the idea is um, very wishful thinking. Everyone will benefit due to globalization, like it washes over everything and everything instantly improves. Well, that's not the case at all. And particularly with all the, all the environmental crises hitting the world, globalization alone is certainly not going to solve that problem. So, I, we, everyone likes and we need a solution. Queremos una solución urgente. This is a... Uh, uh, a very sad image from the aftermath of the earthquake and the subsequent tsunami in um, Constitucione in Chile that hit last year in the spring and actually then came back again this spring uh, in, a, in a mild form. Um, and the most plan was designed by Elemental Alejandro Aravena, who gave a lecture here a few months, a month or two ago, I think. So we need a solution. Um, and in the past, how did they achieve a master plan solution? It was purely top-down, it was mod modernist, it was determinist, it was a blueprint, everything set in advance, 
It was very formal. It was based on the morphology, the forms of the, of the static buildings, about what they would look like. Um, but, it, but it basically, and it often usually put all the uh, working spaces in the city far away from the residential spaces. Now we know that that is no longer, it's no longer needed. Cities are, are now post-industrial, we're now reusing industrial buildings. And so that kind of division is no longer any use to us. We, and mixed use has a lot more of value for all societies, in fact. So therefore, uh, we don't want a rigid blueprint. We want tools and mechanisms for making a better future. And I think all so they stand a much better chance of surviving if um, people get consulted very uh, strongly and, and have a say in the process. And that's the um, Huffen City Hamburg master plan, which is um, uh, making a whole new piece of city in Hamburg at the docks, while well, the dock at the, the port continues to, to have a laugh. You don't close down the port and just have a housing, you have both. So the people, uh, what, public consultation is a very important part of my study. How each master plan has actually gone out about that. Uh, did people even vote in some cases? Now there are a lot of countries where they're not invited to vote. In China or Abu Dhabi, the strong government will see them through the projects very quickly, but they don't generally have a tradition of asking people what they want. So, um, master plans can also be very small, they can be very modest. This is a proposal to um, reuse uh, old car parking structures in, in a particular area of Istanbul by young architect Superpool. Um, so, conventional architecture, conventional planning is really uh, just using criteria of maximum profit, minimal costs. It's about carving up land into nice parcels that then uh, people can then buy and use and make maximum profit. And it uses a simple um, area ratio approach and uh, it doesn't really have a vision. Um, and a lot of the architects I interviewed, they said, we actually don't like the word master plan, we like the word vision. Because everybody agrees that a vision is a good thing. If you say the word master, master plan, they think, hmm, sounds a bit fishy or a bit suspicious to me. Um, and I think that it may be partly it, the militaristic um, overtones coming in, people a bit suspicious about it. So, in our century of complexity, we need to have a, a new title for the, what we're doing. And I like to use the phrase adaptive planning because it uses multiple criteria. It uses emergent intelligence. Um, it needs to be well researched and it's more resilient, more strong as a result because the plan comes from the interaction between decision makers and stakeholders and it's not necessarily imposed um, from higher levels in the, in the hierarchy. So it's situational, it is based on uh, a very profound reading of a situation um, rather than being conditional. And it responds to social, cultural, economic realities. Um, it is based on shared, shared values. Um, so, in the book, I discuss master plans by lots of people as famous as, say, uh, Norman Foster, Zaha Hadid, um, Rem Koolhaas, Ome. Ome have done a lot of master plans, although they made an exhibition in Rome recently of ten master plans of theirs that um, have been stopped. So, but they still regard this as a very important exercise. Case, Case Christiansen, the Dutch master planner, who is behind it. Uh, Huffen City, KCOP, um, uh, Elemental, I mentioned, Metro Grammar, who are in Milan, who are doing a huge plan for Milan 2030, Alejandro Eschenberry, Colombian master planner, West State, who are landscape architects in Rotterdam and master planners, and Tasis, who are, who are uh, Danish and so on. Um, so, I, which plans do I, did I look at? 
well, some smaller, some larger, but I had to make some order. So I came up with some categories. Um, the, let's keep with the half of the city. Um, I said I would look at post-industrial and post-military sites. I would look at post-disaster sites, so basically how do you repair a city that's subject, been subject to a disaster. Um, lots of um, uh, areas where you have to retrofit, you have to um, take out old buildings, old structures, abandoned structures, and, and construct a new condition. Uh, science, technology, cultural districts, so-called eco-cities and eco-districts. Um, um, landscape and landscape infrastructure, different plans, and then plans which actually, the top principle is to um, give uh, everybody more power in the city. So transport infrastructure based on enabling people. So based on more social housing, um, based on, uh, let's say, um, con connectivity. So people can get from A to B. And this is a very important part of uh, most plans in Latin America, in say places like Mexico City and um, so on, where they, uh, they don't do it in a top-down way in order to basically make the most out of the land, but they, make, they do it in such a way that they will enable uh, people in their, in their lives. Um, and then also regional plans and long-term plans that plan as far as 2030. So I've looked at the public consultation, and there's often workshops, design charrettes, voting, and so on, um, to... Uh, consider what people's hopes and dreams and, and fears are. And I also looked at the reality, I'm sorry, some of the, the, the captions are cut off on the left, but I look at also at the reality that master plans often involve lots of different practices. So in this one in Almere, in, in the Netherlands, uh, very close to Amsterdam, MVRDV are the chief master planners, but for one particular district, where in fact in Almeria the city has great, great um, tradition of um, self-built housing and working with lots of architects. And this particular district ha had a competition and, and involved something like, uh, yeah, up to 30 different practices. So, um, okay. And uh, here's an example of a landscape-driven master plan. If anyone has been to Madrid recently, after four years, the, the Manzanares River has been completely renovated. Its riverbanks now have about six um, connected park, park, parks of different characters. And uh, this very poor area of Madrid is now somehow much more connected to the, to the center of the city. So, make no little plans was the, the saying of the, the master planner, Daniel Burnham, the, the man who created um, Chicago, made the famous plan in Chicago in the 1930s. Um, and I only discovered last December going to Chicago to the architecture center that in fact, when that big Chicago plan went ahead, at the last minute, they cut out all the plans for the social housing. Um, and really, so the grand plan, can be seen grand on the outside, but it leaves out key details that they had previously agreed, and in a way they're letting people, people down. So um, I've got five stories uh, this evening. Um, one is a, um, a plan that got abandoned because the client ran out of money, or didn't get enough money. Um, there's going to be urban development plan, which is past a part of a landscape infrastructure plan of regional significance. Then there's another one which is um, to reinvent a crime-ridden city, uh, crime and drug, drug dealing and, and so on, high level of murders and so on. Uh, one which is about a new ecological urban center and a post-disaster plan. And I think there's one other which is um, a certain, I think that is a Zaha Hadith plan, anyway. So none of them is generic. You know, gen the generic approach to space, uh, this is probably something that the Americans, the tradition of building um, 
designing new urbanism, so capital N, capital U, where they, um, I think they're more proficient on the small scale and they design, let's say, typical town, typical, they use co design codes. But in fact, if you look at what they do, they don't do much research. And they're not really interested in the history of the city. They somehow stamp an identity onto a place. Uh, and it, you, you, it could be somehow interchangeable. Um, uh, none of these plans can be directly copied, but to me they all demonstrate a good, good approach to making tools, operational tools, to actually in a way resist this condition of the urban, of the generic city, which is um, something that uh, e e urban think tank, you I can't see the urban, urban think tank who are professors of urban design at UT. UTH in Zurich are very much against. They work in um, a retrofitting the favelas in, uh, in Caracas and uh, in, in uh, Sao Paulo, as well as other, other societies. Um, okay, so um, we're also in a, working now in an era where, where everyone has unprecedented access to the internet. Um, uh, website documentation, public blogs. People now blog on master plan on the websites of um, master plans and give their comments. Um, I have read pages and pages of comments about, say, the Seattle waterfront and so on. Um, now that the, this is a reality, it's a lens through which to view and investigate the world. So. Uh, we have now, so Google Earth, we have green map systems, which are used by environmentalists. They document the green spaces, where they are, the bike paths. They, they, they um, investigate where endangered habitats are and, and more. So a whole range of environmental conditions. Anybody can go on the internet and, and find out what they are and where they are. And in fact, overlay, add their own comments and so on. Um, uh, because of the hyperlink nature of the sites, and the New York Times website is a particularly fine um, mechanism of dynamic information in, where you can really investigate a phenomenon and it, it's somehow superior to television in, 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 a, in a way, that it, you actually learn things in a more three-dimensional way. So, and world mappers, which is another um, uh, web, webzine, they allow people to feed in data about lots of global economic factors from population growth to energy use. Um, so they produce maps. So you can see the difference also between the way in which the developed world and the developing world are changing in relation to each other, which I think maybe in the past we have many books, but they're all separate books. So how very few compare the two, or, or, or compare the two in a, in a dynamic way through time. Um, now this company, walkingpapers.org, they have free geographic data, it's a kind of wiki, like wiki style, open street maps, and users can edit, they can search um, for their favorite map, and they can edit and update them online, so they can personalize the locations with their own, whatever they want to add. And this tool has been used in humanitarian uh, relief efforts like in Haiti, or in areas where people are disenfranchised, where they're really lacking access to the internet, access to uh, social resources. Where, where on the ground, physically, there's a, lot, a lack of um, information to help lobby for changes to urban infrastructure. So um, I think this is a very good phenomenon and it's somehow we, we're not going to go back in time and not have it in the future and it's going deep, to it deeply influence the way in which we see master planning because we as citizens are already now enabled through technology to see the world in, in different ways um, and also in, intervene with our own information and our own views to somehow personalise our our, real, our sense of reality. Okay, so um, Brasilia, of course, is a very famous 
A famous master plan, City of Brasilia, was built very quickly in only four years. Um, last April, it celebrated its 50th anniversary. And, well, while it's a very beautiful form graphically, um, I wondered if the interpreters come come yet. Have they arrived? So. Not yet. Am I going too fast for anybody? No? Okay. What? Am I going too fast for anybody? Because I know you don't have an interpreter yet. I carry them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the, sp the, the plan itself, beautiful graphic, Brasilia. But the public spaces are not very well liked. The individual buildings by Oscar Nima, fantastic, really beautiful. Um, but the public spaces, no one in the master plan mentality in their head thought, what are we going to do with these public spaces? It was much more the individual iconic buildings. Um, and that's quite, quite revealing. And we, we, wouldn't, we would hopefully not make a master plan like that now. And um, Corbusier in the Chandigarh, in, when he designed the Chandigarh in the Punjab in India, it was very integrated and it had a, a huge amount of green space everywhere and lots of uh, green walkways, greenery along all the streets. Now it's very popular because it's a new industry, a new high-tech hub in India, one of the high-tech hubs in India. So a lot of young people want to live there. A few years ago you would, wouldn't see anyone on the street after 10 p.m. But now there, there are a lot of people working in the IT industries who live there. So they had to expand and the nearby town councils starting to design and build new towns. Unfortunately, they didn't refer to the original master plan. They wanted to do it entirely in their own way, which I think is a real shame. I wasn't expecting them to copy it, but on the other hand, they're satellite towns and they're copying the West. They're copying other models, which I think is, is a pity. Um, yeah, let's stay with that one. Another example, um, if you've been to Berlin, to Potsdamer Platz, um, redeveloped to a master plan by the Italian architect Renzo Piano in the 90s, it has been criticised because the corporate architecture is very bland and one-dimensional, um, but also, above all, because it doesn't blend in to the older neighbourhoods next to it, surrounding. It's such a big dividing line. We're in one, in one kind of urban brain, a character of neighbourhood, you cross the road and then suddenly you're in this great big corporate soup. And a lot of people hate, hate that. Now, this is a master plan by Rem Kulhas, OMA, Waterfront City in Dubai, which uh, didn't go ahead. Um, it's one of the ten master plans that they made the exhibition about in, in Rome, which they were commissioned in the last few years, but it won't go ahead now because the city is now having to have support from Abu Dhabi. Um, it looks a little bit scary in my, <laughs> my view. And um, I've actually, in my book, I put uh, Erme's uh, fantastic plan in, for, in Shen, near Shenzhen for Kanhai Port City, which is absolutely beautiful, both in the concept and also the, the graphics as well. This one, I think, it, uh, just the idea of all the tall buildings, it, it went to their head. Um, so, this is exceptional because it's, do uh, you know the phrase tabula rasa, working in a whole new uh, area without any building there, you start from nothing and begin. What is much more common with a master plan is uh, a condition like Milan, uh, which is, of course, a very um, strongly, was a strongly industrial city. It's now post-industrial. All the car industry has been, been moved out or has been adapted, like Fiat, Fiat Lingotto factory. So Garibaldi Repubblica is a, um, the plan, the Porta Nuova plan, reunites three neighbourhoods that were previously divided because of the industrial domin domination of industry. To, 
in order to re reunited around an enormous new park designed by um, that uh, inside outside the Dutch landscape architect in order to make it a, an entire hub but hopefully a hub that because of the sensitive landscaping is not going to look anything as as dull as, as Potsdamer Platz. So maybe Potsdamer Platz was a product of its time, and I, I don't have an image of that now, but um, uh, let's hope we, we, we won't be doing it much like that in the future. So that's Milan. There's a lot of very horrible skyscrapers cropping up in Milan, so it does need that there's quite a lot of um, business um, development there, so it does still need master plan. So anyway, um, whatever the condition of the city, the reality is that the traditional categories of space, residential, commercial, industrial, they're breaking down. And also the distinction in the 20th century between the home and the workplace is also being blurred. And blurred in a way that we, we almost never experienced before. I mean, the other day in London, I went to see um, some uh, a scheme for full price housing, which also had social housing, and you you could not tell where the social housing was. In the Netherlands, you would never know. In the UK, you would always know where the social housing was because the, the developers always put it on the edge of the site right, because that's where the poor people live. Um, Unfortunately, that is the, the tradition in the UK. But moreover, in the site, there was a big doctor's surgery as well. And that is a very innovative program, and it's somehow public-private hybrid. Um, and that, my argument is we don't have much time anymore. We don't want to be going everywhere. We, we would really appreciate to have this kind of um, uh, integration in, in our lives, if possible. So, um, famous master planner, Norman Foster, um, uh, admired the world over. Now, his scheme for Santa Giulia, which was a, another post-industrial district in, in Milan, it became a victim of the economic crisis, a, a real shame. Um, Westgate were doing the landscaping to create this big um, triangular shape, a big green line to the area. So. Um, that everyone living there would have plenty of place to just go and relax. It was, in a way, designed like a city within a city, so 1.1 million square meter site. Um, it was going to transform the southwest of Milan, and give it a gateway, in fact, on the scale of, of Battery Park City in New York, or let's say Canary Wharf in, in London. It was going to be the first of its kind in Milan for over 50 years. And it was going to be mixed use with everything you can think of, like housing, offices, shops, um, cineplex, and, and uh, the, big, the big park. Um, big long promenades, um, very wide, 24 meters wide, so big enough to take new tram lines to extend the tram system in Milan. Water features, covered areas that look like the typical Milanese shopping streets, or Milan or Bologna, and so on. Also, avoid this feeling of suburbia. So, not really suburbia, because not so far away, but suburbia is somehow seen as dull and one-dimensional. So, keep, keep the cosmopolitan side of the city there still. But unfortunately, it was um, we call a hypothetical question, or can have this discussion, but it didn't ever get realised because that's very glamorous. Um, because it sits at the moment, it's half built, um, without any of the green space, uh, no schools, few services. The city council said okay to the developer, Rizanamento, if you're not going forward with it, we won't bring our Congress Centre here, we take it somewhere else. So that was a further kind of slap in the face. Um, and in 2007, the developer was selling the flats at eight to 9,000 euros per square metre. But now, well, one year ago, the price went down to, say, 2,000 um, euros per square metre. And I imagine right now, nobody really wants to live there because it's like a dead, you know, a dead, dead town, really. Um, 
Now, that was very embarrassing for M Milan, but um, architects themselves, they can't predict, they can't prevent these outcomes. Architects always say that genetically, in their DNA, they're always very optimistic. Um, and then, of course, so are developers, but developers are also really over-optimistic. Um, I interviewed, though, on a different side, looking at Milan, I interviewed the deputy mayor, Carlo Mazzaroli, because they have a new urban development plan for Milan for 2030. Um, and it's, uh, it was incredibly uh, comprehensive. It has an entire economic plan attached to it, where they've worked with uh, an Italian version of Goldman Sachs to come up with a way in which the, the city council is very poor, um, how they could somehow um, end up after a few years owning more land by the deals that they did with the developers. Um, I won't explain the formula, but it is now actually published and it is available for somebody. And I think it's an incredibly impressive piece of work because the the design of the master plan is beautiful. Um, it's also got an incredible landscape concept to it, called Raggi Verdi, which is um, great green rays. Um, the idea is that uh, it's an environmental strategy. It links the, the green belt around Milan to each of the um, city's urban districts um, by this network of cycle pedestrian parts, which are like rays coming out from the centre. Um, it's based on a very intense mapping of the city. So before there were, how many, how many neighbourhoods were there originally in Milan? Um, ooh, I forget now. It's not over ten. But Metrogramma, the two young architects, um, and they are pretty young to have such a major role, they came up, they did research across every, every area of the city and they decided that no longer should the city be 88, no, no longer the old neighbourhoods traditionally, but they should have 88 new neighbourhoods. So each one a lot smaller, fewer people. Um, the services should be, the social services should be redesigned as well in order to cater for these new categories. So therefore, they should be based on reality of what people wanted, rather than on, on some outdated um, demographic, outdated plan. Because often, um, state support is based on an old, old information about what's happening. It's not up to date, it doesn't keep track of people, immigrants coming to the city, demographic, people moving out of the city and so on. Um, so uh, formally, the plan also redefines Milan as a network lattice, um, which takes the place of the original um, hub in the centre, the heart, and the spokes, like a bicycle wheel. That was the original way in which the planners in Milan saw the city operating. So Metrogramma argued, well, this is where we did it in the past, but we don't need to do it like that anymore. Um, and so these old administrative zones get cut up um, because they're no longer, they, they don't represent local identity and it's localism that their argument is that the sense of localism it is absolutely key to the sense of cultural vitality. So you could say, you no know, one neighbourhood here is a Strelka neighbourhood in, in a way. So it's all about thinking much more small scale, um, which again gets away from the more the scary uh, militaristic sort of notion of a master plan. I mean, the urban development plan in Milan is the entire city and it also talks in a very detailed way about relationships with neighbouring cities like Lugano and it talks about transport corridors and so on. But the great thing is it takes care of the macro in a mature way but it also looks in very much at the micro. It's like very detailed jewellery or tapestry. So, in a way, for me, it's like it's quite a masculine master plan, it's also a very feminine master plan, if I can say that. <laughs> okay, so, um, as I said, the Raji Verdi is the, the network of um, cycle paths and um, pedestrian routes, and uh, uh, it's designed by the Italian German master, Ge Italian German landscape architects called Land. 
Andreas Kippar is German who's lived in Milan for a long time and he's always been talking to the council and he actually sat down and designed Raji Verdi. He wasn't commissioned. And this, I've found, has happened a lot, that an architect living in a city feels so strongly that they have a way of seeing the city and they live there and talk to their friends, that they really want to bring this concept to the attention of the city council. And the city council maybe is much slower and worried about issues like um, cleaning the streets and... Um, more uh, down-to-earth issues. So in, in three cases I found that just by getting in touch eventually these things get taken on. Um, so um, Kippo's vision is that urbanism is inseparable from living systems. Um, it's, uh, they are not just a mere um, about, they're not merely for physical amenity, they're not merely for just going recreational play spaces, but they're embedded and they're integrated. Um, uh, so I could explain to you exactly where the, the green rays go, but I think that there is, with a landscape urbanism plan, you can reconnect, you can connect neighborhoods that previously were not connected before, because you create um, new pathways that people had never co considered. And uh, in the process of um, doing public consultation for Raji Verdi, they had a lot of um, they had bike, 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 race, uh, bike races, they had lots of parties um, and social activities to get people talking about how this might really work if it was uh, implemented. Because it hasn't been implemented yet, but it will be in, in the future. Um, but Kippa said, said, in the past, in, uh, unlike in the past, in today's cities, green urban spaces are no longer set apart in a specific section of town or city, but they're places for daily interaction, which acquire value only if they become an integral living part of the city uh, itself. Um, part of Milan is an easy, fluid, and welcoming, welcoming city. So it's a mix of um, green spaces, but also taking into account historic fragments, old, old buildings who are, which are part of the site and then uh, are retained in certain places. They are, it's completely different to the, uh, to the old modernist utopian tabula rasa, blank space, a blank sheet of paper approach. It's more reformist, in fact, and it starts with what is really there, what is there, and it values, it assesses and values what is really there, and proposes changes from within. Um, and it also is, is very much about, uh, say, certain sort of sustainability as well. And intimacy of public spaces, too. So um, here we have another post-industrial city. This is um, Thoro Thare in uh, the north of Spain, in Bilbao. And Zaha Hadid um, was invited. It's not realized yet. Again, there are a lot of master plans which um, have gone on hold, and, and that's why the OME made their exhibition. In many cases, you, we, you can probably guarantee they'll never go ahead because the developers just don't have the money. But in some cases, it really is more the councils are behind the scenes now negotiating with a whole array of um, private concerns to get enough money together, get a consortium together so that they can somehow at a point, certain point tip in the direction of implementation. And, and I hope Thorothari will, will succeed. So it's a 60 hectare scheme and it's um, cradled in the long curve of the nerve which um, is really very strong, given a very, has given a very strong um, cue to the project. Um, it responds to different topography, the existing topography, uh, sorry, I should say, which is um, like this. Oh. And uh, its aim is to bring, as Zaha Hadid said, a sense of differentiated unity. So you feel that everything is cohesive, 
but you also allow, you can enjoy the variety there as well. So it's um, it's not messy. It's not piecemeal. Um, so it will in the future have nearly 15,000 new residents and have workshops, laboratories, studios, offices for 6,000 more workers. And in the past it had been completely separated from the neighboring communities by a canal um, which was open to enlarge the port. So as the, the port operations expanded, let's say the social life became cut, cut off. And so in the future it will be extended to help with flood control, and this will make Thorothari an island in a very strategic position. So it's, um, it's got a very well-defined urban grid, and, and Zaha's project will create a, quite a finely textured ground, sweeping the whole le length of the site. So. Uh, the city's got three loose districts and it will be well connected with its neighbouring areas now by a lot more new bridges. And the architects, the way that they lay out um, their new elements, so they're like building blocks, like tiles, each one over a thousand square metres and they allow the ground to respond to, to the curving river, the, the, the curving spine of the river and the street grid and shifting the orientation of the buildings from upstream to downstream. So the buildings are turned, if you can see, perpendicular to the long axis of the river. So it opens up their fabric so that you can see long pathways. In uh, pathways and views that you couldn't before, so a lot of retrofitting. And then the tiles have a platform structure to defend against floods, and then they create space for underground parking underneath. And they also allow the riverside promenade to, um, to dip closer to the, um, the normal level of the river. So Zahar and her team, they say this organizing structure is one that allows a very densely built environment to go together with a, a strong sense of porosity. So sense of permeability. So you, you've got lots of waterside promenades, parks, Central Avenue with trees, small squares, public, public gardens. Um, so you, you don't feel in any, at any point that you've got a barrier between you and the river. So somehow the, the, the reality and the condition of the river is, is embraced in, in a way that it would never have been in industrial times because that wouldn't have been a priority. Of course, you take the industrial uh, fabric out of the equation, you've got a lot of things to, to play with in the, in the game of master planning. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm also looking at plans which have their, their intention is to strengthen social conditions of all citizens, to, to bring social e sense of social equity now, as I said, it's been particularly strong in, in Latin American metropolises. So for a city like, a mega city like Sao Paulo, um, the Brazilian planner, Jorge Wilhelm, who has been very influential there, he's stated that the rehabilitation or the improvement of the urban environment goes hand in hand with strengthening the social and political power of citizens who don't have it. Um, now, Medellin in Colombia um, has had, until recently, well, he's still very active in politics, but his mayor, Sergio Fajardo, um, implemented a wonderful master plan recently, which has won awards. Um, and his concept was, let's create the most beautiful for the most humble. Um, his notion that anything that you give to the poor is a plus. And so the pl master plan led by um, Alejandro Echeverri, it's a program of um, four, uh, no, ten library parks for the city, symbolizing a new cultural era of, of cultural improvement, um, including the, you can see the gradient here, but the uh, Park Biblioteca España, which is designed by 
Giancarlo Mazzanti, right on the hilltop of a barrio, a district which was the most dangerous, um, uh, the worst for murders and drug dealing. And uh, these facilities have really transformed, the, uh, helped to transform the, the, the uh, lives of a lot of people. It was completed in four years ago, over four million dollars. Um, in fact, it was the most dangerous in the whole of Latin America. And uh, since this whole master plan has been implemented, the number of homicides and murders in Medellin has gone down dramatically. Um, but in the 1950s, there was a master plan by two architects, and the city had to abandon it because of financial and political instability. But uh, various laws along the way Actually, some, well, a law required um, in 1997 all the city councils in Colombia to make public space renovation plans and implement them within three years. So nobody got, got off. Everyone had to do this, however little money that they had. So that began a lot of uh, it beginnings process of, of change. And Boca, Bogota, the capital, um, already had a very successful renovation plan based around um, transport, uh, new cycle parts, new, a new bus system and so on. The Medellin is smaller, it's only three and a half million people and it's uh, and also smaller in size. So it really needed to have not just schools and libraries but community centres, medical centres and so on. And, and the part of the plan was to introduce a new metro. So six years ago, a new um, cable car. Um, well, the metro was 95, and then the metro cable gave access from the poorest barriers across the town. So literally connecting areas that somehow had otherwise been very difficult for people to go into and come back again. But also changing the perception of how those communities were. Um, Fajardo, he assembled lots of professionals and academics to work together with him. Um, he, he was given advice to bring in international consultants to bring, improve the city's image, like making brand up, branding. But he, he decided to only work with people from in, within the city. Creative policies that range their new waterfronts, new plazas, um, and they made a, one, one policy, one side of the plan was to work really with the poorest districts and also to consult people about the, um, the, the plans themselves. So you've got, can you imagine, public meetings where you have um, teenagers, single mothers, um, the guys who used to, you know, the guys who run the barriers with their guns, um, and they would can't be invited to join the group. And, um, discuss and to break, break down the barriers and break down the fear and so on. Um, and the city also gave loans for small businesses as well. Um, and like a lot of plans I, I have witnessed, I've read through, it, it's got maybe I, I'd say sort of 30, 40 different aspects to it. Um, the one was, one fourth program was to, to recover the street, so encourage people to uh, to walk again in a city that's been dominated by, by, by cars. Um, and so also the founding street in Medellin, from north-south, um, had become very, some, somehow seen as very mediocre and poor, but they um, created some improvements to old buildings, then they added in these plans, they added in new uh, facilities like the um, Park Explorer here, which is a new science centre, um, the um, uh, botanical garden was renovated and had added to it an orchid, orchid diorama, which is um, a garden where they grow orchids and so on. Um, and they opened up the landscapes to the street, they added street cafes, restaurants and so on. They um, redesigned those pavement services and, and took care of every, of every aspect. So 
that, that of course, is city centre, so this is probably Medellin at its most glamorous. But if you look at the dozen, the hundreds and hundreds of images that in every single neighbourhood, and the, the Mazanti Library is one other example, of course, that it's not just, uh, let's say, gentrification, if you know that word, um, improving the centre and forgetting about the, the outskirts, but it, it is very strategically in all the areas, so that everybody, everybody benefits. So um, Alejandro Echeverri, he calls his approach social, urban, social urbanism. Um, and a lot of footbridges, simple, simple, modest footbridges to connect um, mountainous areas that somehow nobody had thought about having a bridge um, in that particular location. And Fajardo is um, the mayor, no longer the mayor, but is working elsewhere in the, in the country. And they've now set up a new urban uh, research center at the university looking, they're trying to combine all these issues, environmental, social, cultural issues with urbanism. So also thinking actively about how to improve the politics as well, as they realize that um, you need to change the social policy instruments at hand in hand, this is an ideal situation, along with the, the urban design. Um, and this kind of whole approach is now is being spreading to other cities in Colombia who also have built public schemes. It's been very influential. Um, Fajardo, since he was very, very small, he always was very convinced that aesthetics was a tool for social transformation as a message of, of inclusion. So underneath all of it, the most important word in all those urban interventions in which architects plays an important role is the word dignity. Um, he said, many people have a solid wall in front of them. At one end is a door to enter into the world of illegality, to drug dealing and so on. And another door leads to informality and homelessness. And our ch challenge has been to open the doors in that wall so that people can pass through them and go on and participate in the construction of hope instead. So, the other thing that's become so very strong in my mind, in my research, is the role of the mayor and the role of more the deputy mayor in Milan. It doesn't have to be the chief mayor, but the, you need to, to have a champion who is prepared to push the project, to, to fight to have a competition, fight to keep the standard high, fight to avoid, the corru avoid corruption at any stage of the process. Get, get the private money on board, because you need to have private money, because a lot of the, the public municipalities are so poor now, they could, you know, um, in the economic crisis, everyone is having to cut budgets a lot. Um, I mean, what, one of the councils in London, they were telling me they can no longer do any more public consultation for their new urban design. So what will they do? How will they tell everybody? And I said to you, well, can you not just make an enormous list of all the email addresses of everybody you've ever, all the people you've ever spoken to, and then make a, an e-flyer and just email them every time you're going to do something. I mean, that's free, really. Um, but they always, before, they spend money doing, let's say, sort of a workshop in the street and have a street party as a way of um, having discussion. But... But I think the main thing is, so long as you do it, um, don't leave it out. So, uh, just turn quick, quickly on uh, the so-called eco-city. Now, eco-city rarely means a whole city. Um, Foster is designing in its first phases of being built. Mazda city in Abu Dhabi, and that's not a new city, it's an area of, of Abu Dhabi. Um, Dongtang eco-city, was in fact designed as a small, uh, some people would say more like a town, um, with a new road coming from Shanghai. Uh, but to, to my mind, it, in a way it's more like a town or a small district, but unfortunately Dongtang Eco City was one of the first, but it didn't go ahead for two reasons. One, the, the chief executive of the developers was um, uh, caught by the government for corruption, so that was the end of that. 
But also they didn't do any public consultation in all the plans. You, you never really understood exactly who they had in mind to live there. And I don't think that helped in the end to encourage the, the government and the bankers. Um, but eco-cities, they being the generally small districts or extensions of town of, of cities. Uh, in Spain, there have been some very interesting ones. And Monte Corvo Ecocity extends Logrono. It's in the area of La Rioja, the big wine-producing region. And um, some people have said, oh, no, it's too far out of the city. Um, it's all affordable housing, OK? Um, some people are saying, oh, no, it will look like a ghetto. It'll be too far away. It's a bit like you're saying, put the poor people in their own town of their own. Um, but it has been given a go-ahead by the government who runs the whole region. And it, it shouldn't necessarily be a ghetto. It's also, I think it's a demonstration project. It has, um, it's designed by MVRDV together with the Spanish architectural practice. And it's, the idea is going to be CO2 neutral footprint producing renewable energy on the site. It's 56 hectares. And in fact, the plan is only for 10% of the site. Um, it's a, a very linear, compact urban development that meanders through the landscape. Um, and then it will have 3,000 social housing units of apartments that all face the, town, the city of Logrono. Um, sports facilities, retail, restaurants, infrastructure, public private gardens, and so on. And it is um, using the topography very well, um, making use of differences in height. It's got two hills that you can see here and then in the distance. Every apartment has a fantastic view of the city. Um, and the lower roofs are accessible, so you can use them for public space. And if you can see the housing plans here. Um, the, just go back. Yeah. The rest of the site will, is in fact entirely an eco-park. So mixing park with energy production so it, there's two small hills, they've got the beautiful views, and the slopes are south facing, facing so it's easier to generate solar energy. So you can see enormous um, sea of PV, PV cells on the hills, um, and then um, uh, windmills on the top, and then there's a funicular, you know, the small type of um, railway to get to, the, to a museum at the top of one of the hills and a viewing point with a research centre for renewable and energy efficient technology. So I think that hopefully due to the quality of the overall programme, the way in which all the different facilities are put together, that it would never become like a poor people's ghetto. I mean obviously it, would be, it is designed for people with lower incomes, but it would hopefully also be a place where with a visitor centre researchers would come People working in the clean tech industries, you know, in renewable en energy industries, would come and have meetings and conferences and so on. So that it would, in a way, after it was finished, develop its own very unique urban identity. That you could perhaps ne not say, okay, this is like an area of um, Madrid, or uh, that it would somehow, it would be well, not rural and not urban, but not suburban, but it would be the best of all of those. But it, I do think also, I think and the way it's been laid out, it shows very beautifully how technology can blend into the landscape rather than overpower it. So the final um, case study is uh, talking of crises and um, environmental crises. It's uh, Elemental's master plan for Chile. Um, Constitucione is Chile's second city, and it's, um, it's south of the capital of Chile, Santiago, uh, 350 kilometers south. It's a seaside resort, has a lot of fishing industry, fishermen there, um, who you know, re rely on having access to the coastline. And it's near the mouth of the river, Mall, 
and the Pacific Ocean. So it was hit by this 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake, earthquake and then the tsunami last February, not this one, year, last year, and over nearly 600 people were killed and over 2 million people. 80% of the, the city's population were left homeless. Um, so this is nothing like the size of what happened in Japan. But the plan shows how recovering a city like this, um, how in areas that are vulnerable, in size, seismic terms, because of the tectonic plates, can be re reinvented. It's not just about throwing up um, emergency housing. and There's a lot of emergency housing that's brought into these disaster zones. It's, it, it's like old army barracks in L'Aquila in Italy, where they had the earthquake. And Berlusconi gave the go-ahead for the, for the emergency housing. And, you know, typically Berlusconi, he gave it to one of his friends in the construction industry. And the local professors of architecture, they were saying, this housing, it's like military housing, it's horrible. And it had been, it's, it's, the idea was for it to be permanent. So, okay, you need uh, tents and things on the ground immediately to immediately respond to a disaster. But um, you need to design for a longer term. You, you can't just have a very short term bad solution and then intend to use it for a long term. Um, and obviously when you're doing a master plan in an aftermath of disaster, you have to work very fast. And Alejandro Aravena said that they had to create, come up with the entire plan in a hundred days so to do, go in and do all their research. Um, most of uh, the 70% of all the city, city's buildings had collapsed, including many uh, um, historic structures. And they, they weren't new. Um, buildings anyway, they were mostly made of um, mud, of sun, adobe, sun-dried mud. And the president said that in a way that the reconstruction, it, the total reconstruction would take three to four years. So they set up a public and private alliance um, to develop the master plan and they had a consortium of institutions and consultants. So Elemental had the key, key role. Um, and from the beginning, they said it would be with a full uh, participation of the community, and so therefore, get it done in a hundred, get the plan um, on the table in a hundred days. Um, so they had to have design ideas that, with public backing, so they had to get them to vote on it. But they also had to design the mechanisms, how they would actually go about implementing it as well, so think about how they would make the action team. So they had to do everything at once. Um, the idea was not just to recover what they had before, but to um, uh, create a new city comprehensively so that people could enjoy a better uh, quality of life. Um, so it's four areas, infrastructure, public areas, um, housing and energy policy. So these plans, I think there is one Yeah, there's a lot of drawings like this which analyze the site from all these different perspectives, so the different needs, and then you, the ideas, you look at them all together and you can compare between the information and cross-reference and so on. And many facilities um, made a list of all the things that they needed, cultural centre, schools, a new fire station, a river park, a new, whole new boardwalk along the coastline for, for tourists and everyone, cycle parts, bus station, um, absolutely, absolutely everything. And then the idea was to rebuild all the buildings um, that had been destroyed and so on. So, um, also Elemental were asked to try to protect the city from tsunamis in the future. Now, it's very, very difficult. I mean, obviously in Japan, had a lot of the buildings not have been designed to withstand earthquakes. Many more of them would have um, they would have been destroyed. But you know, in Japan, the coastline was completely really suffered. But typically, what happens is they put up concrete barriers in Japan and Hawaii. They 
concrete barriers. But instead, Elemental said, we're going to do it differently. We're going to make a park with a forest um, because it's a geographical response to a geographical threat. And that the, um, the park itself is made of wood, uh, let's say the, there would be lightweight buildings on solid first floors built along the borders of the park and they're made by wood and they're protected by the, green, uh, the new green space. Um, so the combined effect was to allow people to still live by the coastline. You could say that is stupid. Why, why attempt to paint again? But the, the fishermen really need to live by the seaside in order to see in order the, the water in order to continue their livelihood. So there's no point in putting them somewhere far away because it would just make their lives very difficult. Um, so they uh, also um, decided not to rebuild in mud. They would um, bring in a lot of new wooden structures. And they realized there was very few um, aesthetic styles in Constitutione traditionally in the buildings. There, were very, there wasn't really very much to go on. So there was within Chile itself a tradition of the row house. And, um, to be, and so they came up with an idea they would have concrete buildings with wooden walls. So it was, um, this is the, the tourist boardwalk on the riverside. Heavily Coca Cola advertising everywhere, but uh, maybe, maybe Coca Cola is a sponsor. And a new bridge. Um, renovated, uh, you know, new park areas and so on. Um, and one thing that came out of the public consultation was that very few people actually wanted mud houses anymore. They were incredibly happy to have a whole new type, whole new typology. So the row houses. I think there are a couple of shots. Oh yeah, this is before, and that's after. That's a primary school. Um, so they were very happy to, in fact, have their lives complete, the entire environment re redesigned. Um, so Open House Centre was a building that everyone was encouraged to go to, to talk to everybody and hear the lectures once a week, um, confronting citizens with, with the reality of what they were doing, rather than making a more abstract um, analysis of the situation. Because they didn't... They didn't have time to analyze the situation in a more scientific way. So they had to use intuition and propose things to people, get their feedback, and then go back and then uh, sort of adjust things and analyze it. It's more like in prototyping, in a way. Um, so the, her, her, the forums, they had um, local people, they had politicians, technicians, services staff, um, and 94% uh, of the citizens voted in favor. And um, lots of people visited the website and sent ideas in by in paper and so on. And the, the regional secretary for housing was very happy with this consultation because it, it revealed to everybody how the progress was happening. So they actually learned something along the way about the ideas of the architects. And, the ideas of the architects were not to say, right, guys, we're going to do it this way. We will tell you how we're going to do it. They're saying, we are proposing to do it this way. What do you think? And then they would be entitled to explain. And it would be told to them that they, um, you know, there would, would be adaptations. Um, and the housing minister also confirmed that the public-private alliance model could be applied to other effective locations in the entire country as well. They felt that it was sufficiently successful that could be, it's not fully realized yet, but that they felt that it could be applicable elsewhere in the country. So what did the architects learn from this? So they never actually done a, a master plan before and they've never done an emergency master plan, but they learned to think of emergency 
as incremental actions that um, to how to to respond, incremental actions that were fast and improvable. So every go, every step of the way as you're going along, you can adapt. And so not not a linear process, but a lot of this kind of motion to really work out the, the best best way, which is more a more modest way of looking at it. Um, Um, and Aravena feels that ultimately the solutions are going to be more coordinated, more integrated, and more feasible. But he said that the most important, precious resource was the coordination, was the, what they learned about how to work together with everybody and work together with the with the government, with the, with the companies involved, and with the people. So it's not just about being asked to do a design but it's about coming up with deeper questions that need to be solved. So you think, okay, we've got enough questions here, let's just solve the problem. So actually, ironically, part of the process is to ask more questions. Ask questions of the questions. So um, to, to wrap up now, I would say, okay, now who's the great guru of urbanism? Maybe it's not uh, Rem Koolhaas, but um, he did, maybe it is, uh, that's an open question, but he, when he wrote his book, SML XL, which is, uh, well, let me just uh, quickly show you the final ones, different types of housing. Yeah, it, it was published in 1995, so it's 16 years old, 16 years up, um, ago, a um, very major book. Um, he said, urbanism as a profession, it disappeared at the moment where urbanization everywhere was on its way to global triumph. And it means obviously the big movement uh, from the countryside to the cities. So, cities growing because of these migration, migratory shifts. Um, but he reckoned that urbanism as a discipline was uh, not really in a very progressive uh, strategic um, state at that point. So, okay, he thought about a new urbanism that involved the creation of enabling fields that accommodate processes that refuse to be crystallized into a definitive form. They were about expanding notions, denying boundaries. Didn't, I think if you think about the kind of projects I've shown you this evening, denying boundaries, just getting rid of boundaries, creating new connectivities, new permeabilities, were far more important. So he said, not about separating and identifying entities, but about discovering uh, new hybrids, even if you can't even give the hybrids a name that the process of urbanization is about hybridization. Um, so the book it plan tries to be constructive about planning in an age of uncertainty. And it tries to show how, without being rigidly deterministic, with, with um, rigid blueprints that go out of date, master planning or adaptive planning can be a very powerful way of, of bringing about change in cities and regions, not by about bringing new, new set of new icons or creating new ghettos or old ways of doing things, um, but by influencing shifts on, in programs, in the social programs of cities. And architects, I do believe my research that architects now get, are invited in to help the clients design the program in the first place far more than they would have done in the past, because a lot of clients are very uncertain about actually what they want to put in their, in, in their plans. They may say, oh, we want an office building, um, but they're not really sure, you know, maybe they have more social facilities, or we've got a piece of land within our site and we need to do something with it, what should we do? And, and I think this is actually by being observant about your client and, and 
the people who are going to use that program, you can yourself come up with ideas that will be attractive to the client. Not, not just about making lots of money, but about actually fulfilling people's cultural needs. Um, so um, I would rather have um, what Rem's unnameable hybrids than the, the other phrase that Jane Jacobs, the famous American um, urban uh, design, urban planning um, commentator, famous author, she just talked about planning lunacies, the madness of planners, who so scientific and um, dis distance from the rich reality and diversity of cities. Um, so I think the way, since Rem's book, the last 16 years, if you think about what's happened and um, the promise of cities and the, the, um, the, the focus, everyone coming from the countryside, uh, let's say in the age of casino capitalism, and you look around for the public sector, for the state to help you, and suddenly they're saying, no, we can't do this, can't do that, we haven't any money anymore. You can't just let the market um, you can't, you can't just let the market um, take over everything. And you can't just let globalization solve your environmental problems. Because globalization is not in the way, it's not a planning force, it's more like a, it's more a biological <laughs> uh, uh, effect of capitalism. Um, so I think it's an organic evolution, and it's also, it's a story about architects changing influence if they would have a mind to, to, way, to adjust the way they, they think. Now, our mayor in London, Boris Johnson, who's very always a joker, he, he said that the city was the single most brilliant invention of our species. Um, he's like full of advice and he likes to say, one thing he says is we've always got to keep on putting the village back into the city. Um, now which village are we talking about? Because in the past, the village was probably a place where all the gossip was exchanged and um, maybe it was a very dull, dull lifestyle. But I think he's more referring to the idea of scale, so intimacy and so on. Um, I mean, the village has to be governed by good policy instruments. Um, it has to have a certain equilibrium um, and so on. But so I really hope that he means that it has the, the a principle of micro planning, so encouraging the human scale and the intimate and creating a place for hybrids. So the complex personal uh, detail taken care of. So in the, in the face of all these unknowable factors, master plans they need a very deep, profound research. Um, to, in order to grasp hold of the strengths and the weaknesses. And you know in business planning, often they, you will do a SWOT analysis. S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of, um, of an urban territory. In order to have capacity to go beyond um, copying the past, copying other models from other societies that don't fit, um, beyond um, shopping malls and ghettos and gated communities everywhere, which are like a sort of growing, a growing feature of some cities, and going beyond repetition and, and have the scope for hybrids, which ultimately is very simple because it's just about um, creating um, conditions for, uh, to allow freedom for different things that we really want to emerge. So that's what I have to say. I hope that it was um, in different ways helpful and interesting, stimulating for you. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, I, um, you can ask me in Russian and I put my head, uh, headset on. Is the interpreter here? Yeah. <laughs>